Welcome to the CBDA update. My name is Morgan Davis and my co-host is Matt Lewis. We are attorneys operating in the cannabis space and co-founders of the CBD Association or CBDA. CBDA is a nonprofit trade association established to effectively and holistically promote a strong and viable CBD and cannabinoid industries inside the United States and worldwide. Uh, today, Matt and I are joined by Brian Buckley, owner of Hemlin Valley Growers Company and founder of Battle Brothers. Both organizations were founded with the mission of fighting opiate addiction and suicide amongst veterans. Brian, we're so excited to have you with us today. Uh, as I've previously told you, I'm a huge fan of what you're doing and specifically how you formed both of these entities to meet your overarching goal of bettering the lives of veterans. Um, so I would love to um, do a quick overview of your companies for our listeners, and then I'm gonna let Matt take it, take the first question. Um, Hemlin, Hemlin Valley Growers Company focuses in cannabis products that are, ba you're based in California, and you focus on high quality distillate delivered through a personalized vape. And Battle Brothers is the, your nonprofit side, which focuses on veteran access to medical care with opiate alternatives, mentorship and community bonding, and financial growth for veterans through apprenticeship training programs. It's huge, so much you've got going on. Um, so like I said, I'm gonna let Matt kick it off with our first question. Yeah, well, I'm also a fan. Morgan failed to mention that, but uh, we're, we're <laughs> glad that you're here with us today. Um, we really enjoyed speaking to you the other day, kind of learning more about what you're doing. We're actually, we're very, very stoked to kind of bring this. So uh, thanks again. So kind of what we always ask the first, uh, the first question is we want to learn how you got into cannabis. And, you know, unlike most of our guests who you know, are coming from it from a purely business side, your experiences in the, uh, in the military really had an impact on that. So I was wondering if you feel comfortable just kind of telling our viewers just kind of your story about your experiences during war, how you were impacted when you got back and kind of how you got to where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Morgan and Matt, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. And I was really looking forward to this conversation. So <clears throat> really, for me, it's kind of an interesting path of how I kind of discovered the plant. Uh, for me, I grew up in an area called Doylestown, Pennsylvania, which is right outside the Philadelphia uh, area, and played for a really good uh, high school football program. And in my junior year, I started getting recruited by the Naval Academy, and I just had no interest in the military, anything at that time. So I went to the University of Massachusetts and then the events of 9-11 took place and that changed my life like many other Americans. And that's when I decided it was time for me to go earn my citizenship. So I finished that season and the school year at University of Massachusetts and then transferred to Villanova University and got into the uh, NROTC program, which I spent two years there and graduated and was commissioned in the Marine Corps and did a deployment in the infantry uh, in Fallujah, Iraq. When I came back from that deployment, they had me try out for Marine Reconnaissance, made that. Uh, they rewarded me by sending me right back to Iraq six months later. And from there, once I returned, they uh, had a new thing called the Marine Corps Special Operations Command or MARSOC, which is now known as Marine Raiders. And they had me go take selection and made that and spent the majority of my career as a Special Operations Team Commander where I did deployments in Africa, Southeast Asia, as well as Afghanistan, in particular, the Helmand province. And when I uh, transitioned out, uh, you know, I was deemed 100% disabled, uh, not just with post-traumatic stress, but I was wounded while I was in Afghanistan. So I have a, a lot of shrapnel throughout my body and, you know, little bangs and bruises that kind of take place when you do the things that we were doing. And kind of saw some of the um, <clears throat> limitations of the VA. I, I will never badmouth the VA. I think they're doing the best they can with what they have. But for me, it just wasn't really answering the bill. And when I started really paying attention to what was going on with our veterans in terms of the suicide rates, and then you really start seeing what was kind of leading it uh, due to the opioid epidemic, we just wanted to say, like, is there something else we can do? And that's where Battle Brothers came up, where we do a personal, medical, and economic. And during that time, Andy Myers, who's another founder of Helmand Valley Growers Company and a Marine Raider, was just looking really good one week. And when I asked him what was up or what was he doing, what has changed, he's like, well, get ready for this one. He's like, I gave up a joint or gave up a fifth of jack for a joint. And you're kind of like, well, like that was pretty something different. I mean, I never had problem with people using cannabis. It just was never my thing. And obviously you can't use it while you're in the military. But then he kind of went into more in depth of what was happening. And he's like, I'm getting a great night of sleep. I'm not drinking and driving. I'm not blacking out. And he's like, 
and really I'm getting into cultivation and it's helping me transition from a warrior to a gardener, which I just thought was incredibly impactful. So we kind of looked at each other and said, you know, how can we work on this and maybe do it? I mean, I started consuming cannabis and I just started seeing the, the immediate <clears throat> benefits from it. So we just said, let's maybe not just be another veteran advocacy group that's doing great things and working with politicians, but is there another route we can take to really prove what medical cannabis can do? And that's when I had an opportunity to talk with some members of Congress and said, what would be needed in order to get medical cannabis into the VA system? They said, if you can get data and get American doctors, you're going to have a good shot. So through this and a lot of twists and turns and ups and downs, we partnered with a firm called Niamedic Healthcare and Research Services that's based out of Israel. As many people know, uh, Israel is uh, probably about two or three decades ahead of everyone else in terms of their medical cannabis research. So we're very fortunate to work with them and being Israelis, they are all veterans themselves. So they totally empathize with where we were coming from and the benefits they were receiving from cannabis. And then when we really got down into it of saying, how do we fund this? We're not gonna work with NIDA or the National Institute of Drug Abuse, which is ran out of the University of Mississippi. We're probably not gonna get any federal grants or anything like this. How can we really fund this research? And that's when we decided to put our money where our mouth was and we're like, well, you know, this all generate from a Paul Newman salad dressing bottle where it said 100% of profits go to charity. We just talked to our lawyers and CPAs and they're like, you guys can totally do that and it works. And so we formed what we call our, our for purpose company, Hellman Valley Growers Company, where 100% of our profits goes back to our veteran medical cannabis research. And to show how impactful of having this uh, adult use brand out here in California, with the first $50,000 of profits we received, we took that, we paid for a study design with Niamedic to submit to an institutional review board or an IRB in order to get approval to, to conduct human trials using medical cannabis. And uh, we did that. We were approved for an IRB and we were able to actually bring on the University of California at Irvine and their medical staff on top of our research. So when we do kick off our first study with uh, 60 veterans to see if medical cannabis can reduce the symptoms of post-traumatic stress, we're gonna be running that out of UC Irvine Medical the Israeli doctors will be in the lead. The principal investigators will be the uh, medical staff from uh, UC Irvine and more uh, specific Dr. Dominguez, who's an American. So we're kind of checking all of our boxes that we were told to by Congress by saying, we're gonna have the data, we're gonna have the American doctors. And when we prove the benefits, that's when we go forward and raise our right hands and say, here it is, here's your data, here's your American doctors. Can we proceed with FDA trials? This is awesome. <clears throat> I mean, I think the, one of the things that we were so just blown away by is that, you know, not waiting for bureaucracy to cure a very important problem and really actually, you know, being on the front lines of it. Um, <clears throat> I do want to, we have tons of questions, <laughs> questions about all this, but I do want to ask you, um, I do think that, you know, veteran post-war symptoms and post-war treatment is such a very important issue that's, I don't want to say if it's neglected, but it definitely doesn't get the spotlight of that it should, because it's a major problem for a lot of, a lot of people who serve our country. Just taking a step back, you know, <clears throat> Can you maybe speak a little bit to just some of the problems, you know, our veterans are typically facing um, when they come back with post-war symptoms and also maybe discuss some of the challenges they're facing in getting adequate health care? Yeah, man, I think you bring up a really great point. You know, when men and women raise their right hands, and I'll, I'll speak personally, it, it, to me, again, it was for me to go earn my citizenship. I just think I was born with the you know, a, the lucky ticket that I was born in America where we can do anything we want to do if we put our minds to it. And I truly believe that. And we are such a blessed country, which I don't think people, I think we take it for granted where I've been around a lot of places in the globe and I'm not saying we got everything right. And there's a lot of things we got to improve on, but we got a pretty good thing going here. And, you know, I, it kind of struck me with, I would say with my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, Briar, I met her right before uh, deployment in 2012, we were going to Afghanistan, and it was a very rough deployment. Um, you know, I was I was shot during that deployment. I was able to stay. Another team commander of mine, a uh, good friend of mine, he was uh, shot and paralyzed. Uh, the, the gentleman, Matt Manukian, who actually introduced Briar and I together, was a dear friend of mine. He was uh, killed while we were in Afghanistan, and there was a lot of people that she knew were wounded or ultimately paid the ultimate sac sacrifice. And I remember I had to bring Matt home uh, to do a funeral for him in, uh, in San Francisco. And I just came back for, it was about four days, came back, we did a eulogy, and then I was back on a plane over to Afghanistan. 
And for her, it was just kind of overwhelming where she was saying like, you know, I know like 9-11 happened. I knew we were at war, but you didn't really think about it. And it didn't really have any impact on me. But now it does because I know you guys and I'm seeing what you guys are going through. And unfortunately, I think that's how a lot of Americans are. Uh, you know, we had a joke in the military. It's like, well, the military is at, at war. The Americans are at the mall. Like, it's not like World War II where people right. were giving up rations and everyone was kind of in the fight. And I think just when men and women go and fight and they do their thing and they come back home, they're just forgotten. And that's where you see them in the homeless communities and people, do they really care? Um, you know, to see them trying struggling just to kind of deal with the demons that they brought back from the battlefield. Do people really care? I think people just kind of go on with their lives and they don't understand what some of these people have done for them. And they just kind of go by the wayside and that's really sad. But however, no one's gonna care more about a veteran than another veteran. And that's why we said, hey, enough is, is enough. I'm tired of the politics. People throw on their partisan armors these days and you can't get anything done. We're just gonna grab the bull by the horns and make this happen ourselves. Yeah, and I think, I think what's incredible about that is you're 100% right a lot of us don't understand what you all go through when you come back. And we don't un even understand what the VA has the capability to do for you. Um, I know a few guys who came back and started working in the Sheriff's Department here and they the Sheriff's Department here circles, uh, cycles you through the courthouse before you can get on the road. So we see them a lot in the courthouses in different counties. And they talk about how you know, some of them, the most care that they got from the VA was two or three phone calls in the first six months they were back and that's it. Um, and I think you're right. I think the VA is doing the best with what they've got. But what, um, in, in addition to what you've said already, let's say someone is getting benefits from the VA, you know, what does that look like? And if they start using, are they allowed to have access to medical marijuana in states where it's legal? And, um, is that having any effect currently on their benefits? That is a great question. And I get asked, asked this a lot and I love to talk about it. If you are in a legal cannabis state and you have VA benefits and you consume cannabis, you're good. You're free and clear. They can't do anything to you. And um, like I said, I have a lot of friends who work in the VA and they're great Americans. And, you know, they kind of joke, they're like, could you imagine if we took someone's benefits because they smoked some, uh, some cannabis? He's like, we already got enough bad PR as it is. He's like, we don't need any more coming at us. Um, but there are a couple of stories. I mean, I got to warn you about like some close friends of mine. Um, I, I'm a part of this great group called the Veterans Action Council, where we're not a really like a formed 501c3 or anything. It's just literally veterans from all across the country. We uh, meet about two or three times a week via Zoom. And we just talk about, you know, policies, what's going on in each states and all that stuff. You know, we kind of joke, it's like the super friends, we all just kind of come together and converse. And we actually talked about this the other week, where one of the vets came forward and was like, you know, telling his VA uh, uh, primary care, like, listen, I use medical cannabis, and they, they take it down, they're like, okay, do you understand the benefits and kind of went through everything. But now, every time he goes in there, they bring up his use of, of cannabis. And they're like, they kind of look at him, does he have a cannabis abuse disorder? And they start kind of weighing that into things of prescriptions or this, or well, maybe it's probably due to your cannabis. And he's like, I almost feel like I just wish I would have kept my mouth shut because he's like, now it's becoming a bigger deal than it should be. And he's like, cannabis use disorder. He's like, I know they're going to study that. And I get it, but there's no addictive qualities to candy. Like no one's walking around and freaking out because they don't have cannabis or have to do it 24 seven. They use it as their medicine. So that was a little disconcerting when you hear things like that. But those are some things I think veterans have to be used, uh, you know, have eyes open to. And I just tell everyone it's, it's individual preference. What you want to say, what you feel comfortable with, that's your decision. Uh, there's no silver bullet here. But, you know, again, these are great Americans working at the VA. They want to do the best they can with the veterans. We need to do our part and give them the ammo, i.e. data, and let it prove that this stuff does work. And they would be more than happy to pr prescribe someone a gram versus 15 pills. Right. Yeah, we, and kind of piggybacking off of that, uh, a few months ago, we saw the reintroduction of the VA Medical Cannabis Research Act of 2019, um, still in Congress. And... <clears throat> For those who don't know, this bill would require the, the, the Veteran Affairs Department to conduct clinical trials of the effects of medical grade cannabis, the health outcomes of covered veterans diagnosed with chronic pain, um, also those diagnosed with PTSD, 
and uh, cover veterans are those who are enrolled in the VA patient enrollment system for hospital care and medical services. And so I know earlier you said that um, obviously you have great respect for the people at the VA if they're doing the best that they can with what they have. To me, when we talked about this the other day, uh, this just seems, I don't know, it seems like this is going to be a tough sled, uh, tougher to head for the VA because typically when you think about conducting clinical trials for, you know, medical conditions, you would think that would be the job, you know, of, of the FDA or something or cannabis with USDA. And I'm, I'm just curious of your thoughts is, do you think this is the right move to task the VA with this, number one? Um, and number two, do you think they can be successful without the full support, you know, and most importantly, the resources of the FDA? Yeah, that's a really great question. You kind of got me there where I'm thinking like, hmm, it, will this work? But some of the concerns I have, I would ask, like, you're right, you know, like with the FDA and all that stuff, is this really the VA's burden to kind of bear on their on their side? And you kind of look at things, I always say in terms of, you know, legislators, they're the ones who sent us to war, it's kind of their turn to fix us. And you think they would flip right. every rock possible to find what is the best route to make this happen, which, again, uh, there's so much partisanship in this country. I don't think they can agree if, you know, when Monday falls on a Monday and stuff of that nature. <laughs> but my, my concern would be, you know, what are you using? Are you using the cannabis from NIDA, which currently is the only DEA approved license? Now, I know they have some more that are going to come out uh, in the near future, however long that takes. But you literally look at what the NIDA cannabis is. Uh, I mean, it's probably, it's poorly stored. It's probably about a couple of years old. You're going to have mold issues. Uh, someone told me it's almost like you would have to put effort, like as much effort to put in stems and seeds into this cannabis. It's just full of, it's like a forest in there. It's just full of all this bad stuff. And people who have used those as trials, or there are a couple of patients in America who do actually get prescribed cannabis from NIDA it burns up their lungs. I mean, it's literally, you're putting mold. It's, it wouldn't even pass California compliance to go out and to do for consumers. So that really concerns me. And you got to think about the quality of the plant that they have. I mean, I know it has very low THC. Are they really even kind of manipulating things from what they've learned during the research? That concerns me. And that's why I kind of always ask people, it's like, do you think the United States government could do what Elon Musk has done in the past decade? Probably not. That's why, again, I love America. People like me who, you know, I have an IQ that might rival the wall next to me, somehow is pulling this off where we are able to start moving things forward and get things done. And I really think it's going to be people who go out and do this research on a private side and start coming forward and showing the legislators and showing everyone what works. And these are the formulations. I think that's going to be the best route possible. Um, I'm not sure how the VA would want to tackle this. I mean, would they want to contract out private companies to come in and start teaching them? I'm not sure, but I think it would be a very slow moving process. That's why I personally think, yes, the legislators are going to have to approve all this, but I think it's going to come from the private market that's going to make this thing happen. And that's one of the things that's been the most frustrating. And I mean, you nailed it, is the legislators the kicking it to the agencies to make it happen. We've had the farm bill since December of 2018. That was legislators kicking it to the seat to the FDA. We still have no CBD regulations in our country from the FDA. And that's what their job is. I understand there's been a pandemic and we've talked about it, that slowed things down. But if we can't even get research for basic, you know, CBD industrial hemp products, you know, medical marijuana is a much more difficult thing because you're actually, it's going to be medicine for somebody. And so that's why I'm just not super optimistic that we can, if we just sit back and wait on the government, whatever the agency be or whatever the legislature is to get it done, because it's going to take forever. And to your point, which I hadn't thought about, the quality is not going to be that good if we're just using, you know, the, the, the stuff down at the University of Mississippi. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. I think it brings up a really good point, which is um, we often hear that everybody's sort of wish list is federal legalization, that it'll help. Um, but then we think about the federal government doesn't do a very good job of running something this large in any sector so far. Not that they don't try, not that we don't depend on them, but oftentimes it's a multi-tiered situation where you've got federal agencies and then state agencies that build off of one another and then local agencies underneath that. And we often hear complaints about the bureaucracy. I mean, anybody who needs to go get a new social security card and has to go you know, stand in line at social security and local social security office is, has dealt with that situation. Um, so I think your point about if we've got a federal government that's overseeing a medical marijuana program 
in their own facilities. Are we going to get more of what you're talking about, the University of Mississippi, which is poor product? Um, or And so is it best to just leave it how it is and let states legalize as they want to and let the private market handle it? Yeah, I think that's a really great point. You know, we, we discuss this with groups I work with and everyone talks about the federal issues, federal issues. I'm still of the opinion this is a state issue. And I really just think, you know, you had the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and now the Biden administration and, and all three attorney generals. I mean, well, for Jeff Sessions got a little weird, obviously, but they all pretty much said, hey, this is a state issue. Like if they're working it, we're just going to let go down and let them do their own thing. And I think that's how this thing's going to grow and mature, where just states are going to kind of come on board, municipalities are going to start bringing things, and it's going to go uh, really micro up to a macro level, where it just would be so overwhelmingly, you know, showing that, one, there is data, there is evidence, it is, you know, no longer do we look at it as a medicinal, but you can say it is a medical product. And then you also got the population is pretty much overwhelmingly in support. I mean, I looked at a thing on uh, Business Wire, I think two weeks ago, it was like a May 25th article, where 86% of people polled in Arizona said they are for the VA prescribing medical cannabis to veterans, which show me another poll where 86% of people agree on it and you know, I'll, I'll buy you a beer or something. But I mean, that was pretty overwhelming. And I think you're seeing that tide go across the, the country which ultimately will like make legislators a little more comfortable. They know that they'll get elected back in office and so they take a more strong stance with cannabis. Um, so I think that's a positive momentum. But yeah, I think this is going to be really the grassroots and it's going to be the private companies and people thinking outside the box that are going to move this thing forward and just overwhelm with evidence that the legislators can't ignore. Yeah, I think, you know, I think that's been the strongest um, move politically for any sort of marijuana group operating in the space, policy group operating in the space, is the fact that if you can get a poll like that and you're in a state with a voter referendum, you can almost get legislatures to do anything you want by getting the voters to vote on it first. Uh, I'm based right now in North Carolina and unfortunately we don't have that mechanism and so we'll be one of the last to go that route. But um, in every other state where that's a possibility, it's been a huge help to grassroots organizations to the marijuana policy project. Um, so, but taking it back a little bit to um, exactly what your group is doing, something you mentioned earlier about the clinical trials that you're, um, that y'all are self-funding, which is incredible, but also to the, the overarching goal of your organizations, which is to fight opiate addiction. And a lot of people are hoping and praying and thinking that marijuana could be um, a real step in the right direction when it comes to opiate addiction and something other than Suboxone as a treatment protocol. Um, is that the goal of ultimately of your clinical trials? And what, what's your opinion about medical marijuana as treatment for opiate addiction? Yeah, great questions. So you know, one of the, the benefits of us being veterans, and I alluded to this earlier, was where we can look at a legislator in the eye and saying, you sent us the war, now it's your turn to fix us. And we want to use that as a vehicle where, you know, even though I'm wearing a camouflage hoodie right now, but, uh, you know, it's like I'm not in uniform anymore, but I still feel like I'm serving my country. And that's kind of the mindset of everyone here at Hellman Valley Growers Company, and along with everyone we have at Battle Brothers, is that we're serving a higher purpose. And let us be the first ones to go through the breach. You know, we'll take all the fire and all that stuff from people. But we know what's going to be a tremendous byproduct is if we can push this and make it federally legal for veterans, it's not like they're going to say, well, only veterans can use medical marijuana. They're going to say, nope, it's going to open up to every patient in America. And we do really, trust me, we've, I mean, I've had, I don't know, I think in my Afghan deployment from that, I, I ended up having six surgeries. And they do give you painkillers and they do get addictive and you got to have to wean yourself off of them. And, you know, I was very fortunate. I didn't develop a dependency, but I have a lot of good friends who have, and you got to see how it wreaks havoc, not just on them, but on their, you know, their entire orbit of their family and everyone around them. So we really do believe that these, uh, that medical cannabis can be that answer to kind of reduce opiates. Now, you know, I got to be fair here. I woke up from, you know, a surgery where they had to put a plate in my ankle. If someone handed me a joint, I would probably look at you a little differently. Like, hey, let's maybe 
pump this up a little bit with some some uh, morphine or something at, for the for the pain at that time, but not make it so much when you're leaving the hospital, you're just getting pills and pills and pills, and then you form that dependency, and then when you get it cut off, then you're out in the streets looking for heroin. Um, but we do really feel that medical cannabis can be, you know, kind of a thing that, you know, that's why we're, we're named it reducing the symptoms of post-traumatic stress, because it kind of has all that stuff encompassed with sleep, pain, anxiety, and we just want to explore and see if we can start knocking down each domino and see what effects it has. So I think this plan, we've only touched the surface of its potential, but I think it's going to have a tremendous amount of medical benefits on a whole different fronts uh, that we're not even aware of at this time. Yeah, and it's such a common sense you know, um, solution to this issue. I mean, we, I was kind of laughing to myself when you talked about the Arizona poll and then you said 86%. And as we know, Arizona just passed uh, <clears throat> legalization in the, uh, in the November election. But what I was thinking about is why on earth would those 14% be opposed to it? Like, what's the reason for that? That doesn't make any sense to me. It's just like, it, but I think you've touched on it. It's probably the political stigma of it. And obviously, you know, marijuana has caused a lot of problems in a lot of people's lives. I totally understand that. But when you're using it for specific purposes with doctor instruction, it's just, it seems like a no brainer. I mean, and even to your point, I think, um, I think it was recently the NFL is now starting an initiative to start doing research into cannabis mm -hmm. on opiate addiction as well. And so everyone sees it. It's just a matter of getting it done. And that's why going back to what we said earlier, just going on the front lines, I mean, like, we're not waiting, we're doing this now. It seems like the only way to first off, do it right. And second of all, do it, do it in an efficient manner. Yeah, exactly. And you bring up a great point with the uh, National Football League, you know, talking with the uh, scientists at Niamedic. I mean, you get on a phone call with them, it might be for 10 minutes, but you've learned 10 new things. I mean, they're just so far ahead of us. And we were talking about concussions and really what we receive when we get hit by blast waves from uh, improvised explosive devices or IEDs. And I can remember in a uh, deployment in Fallujah, Iraq, and my vehicle, we hit one. And I mean, my turret gunner was just kind of slumped down in the gun. And we all kind of had blood coming out of our ears. We were fine in a sense, but we were concussed and we got rocked pretty good. And a couple of guys hit multiple IEDs or in vicinity of them where they really developed some issues mentally, um, not like a psychological thing. They just had a lot of injury to their brain that really started causing them problems throughout their body. And you know, the doctors at Niamedic just were saying, they're like, you know, you look at the NFL and they're like, when they take those players into the blue tent and if they're deemed they're concussed, the best thing they could do for them at that moment is start giving them cannabis because it reduces the brain swelling and helps speed up the healing process. And to me, I'm like, that's just incredible. You know, instead, they're just going to put the guy on the bench and or maybe take them into the locker room. And then they're going to be like, hey, here's a handful of pills and make sure you wake up every hour. But it was that right. really doing for them? And that we're obviously seeing the lasting effects uh, in terms of what, you know, in the military, we, we deem traumatic brain injury. In the NFL, they look at it as more of a CTE thing. But trust me, they're, they're not exactly the same thing. They're a brother and sister. They're very closely related. And you're seeing the hardships that they have to face later in life. And I had a, a good friend of mine spent about 12 years in the NFL. And he told me his entire career, he utilized cannabis. And he's like about 70% of my friends did. And he's like, it was a little easier then because we kind of had the red X on our calendar, stop using cannabis this day because right. you're drug tested. And he's like, and they didn't randomize drug tests unless, you know, his words were like, you did something stupid and brought like a gun into the locker room or something, then you're going to get a little bit more of an eye. But he's like, after games, we would go back to someone's house who was single. We would do our thing with cannabis and then we would go out. Uh, meet everyone up maybe have a one or two drinks nothing big but we just started getting our bodies to recover and what i thought would be fascinating would be like they probably didn't know exactly what strain or cultivar they were utilizing it was just more or less weed but to use guys like that who use cannabis their entire nfl career versus a guy who never used cannabis during an nfl career and do an eeg and see what their brainwave activity looks like and right. cannabis kind of produce a little bit more healing and these guys are in a little bit better shape than people who went to alcohol and the opiates. I don't know. It could be a really interesting study. Yeah. Yeah, and so that brings up a, a moving a little bit more into the product side of what you do. Um, your company, Hamlin Valley Growers Company, focuses on cannabis distillate delivered through individual vape. And looking through your product line, it looks mostly indica heavy. Is that right? And you have yeah, we, we, we've kind of expanded. So, um, yeah, we started off on the uh, distillate vape, and then we've moved into also live resin, which we basically just right. take the whole plant, you know, we do a fresh frozen with it, and then we manufacture, we don't add anything into it, so you get the entire entourage effect of it. 
And then also uh, we've moved into pre-rolls and we'll move into flour and we're just trying to meet consumers' needs. But one of the products we're very proud of, and I'm going to be honest, is sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, is our Afghanimal uh, cultivar. We really said, okay, Hellman Valley Growers Company, the HVGC came from my uh, unit, 1st Marine Raider Battalion. When you served in the Hellman province, you became part of the Hellman Valley Gun Club and you get an HVGC tattoo on you. And we really wanted to keep a military niche to it. So we just threw HVGC on the wall and we came up with Hellman Valley Growers Company. And then we're like, well, hey, Afghanimal, that kind of works, you know, Hellman Valley, Afghanimal, let's, let's put that together. And when we tried it, I'm like, man, this is like lights out. Like I'm feeling really good. And I'm getting some good night of sleep. So I actually gave it to one of the doctors at Niamedic. I'm like, can you try this out? And he was here in, in California. And he, uh, he called me up the next day. He's like, oh my Lord. He's like, that is, that's it. He's like, I, he's like my routine. I typically, I'll do three hits on a bait pad while I'm making dinner and just kind of loosens up my body and kind of warms up my uh, endocannabinoid system. And, and he's like, and then usually I smoke a joint before I go to bed. And that's my routine. He's like, when I use the Afghanimal, he's like, everything just got euphoric. I felt very calm, relaxed. My body felt really good. And he's like, so then before I went to bed, I'm like, well, heck, I'm going to try more of this. So he took a couple more hits and he's like, and I got one of the best nights of sleep I've ever had in my life where, you know, I got up and used the restroom and I went right back to bed. And he's like, this is exactly what the medicine should be doing. So we've been using like, you know, we don't have any data to back it up, but we just say, hey, word of mouth for veterans who are really having a hard time sleep. Afghanimal is a great one to go to. Um, but again, it's kind of like a, you know, individual preference. We have some that love our sativas uh, it just helps right. them out throughout the day and you know some are really into the hybrid side so we literally just try to make things that basically our veterans and consumers are coming back saying has been positive or impactful and we keep producing it and if we make something that really didn't have an impact on we, we will get rid of it because at the end of the day it's, we just want to make sure our veterans are you know feeling good and uh and comfortable and taken care of yeah I think you guys are... go ahead matt i'm gonna say this may be a dumb question but i'm gonna ask it anyway <laughs> um so thinking about what you're doing and just hearing you talk about the product, obviously you understand the science, you understand what is a quality product. Um, you know, your research study, research study is being managed by the best in the world that are going to do this. Um, and you're, we're assuming you're going to get the great results that facilitate what you're trying to, to advocate. How concerned, if you are concerned at all, are you about some of these other products in the market? Like with the surge in Delta 8 products, the surge in um, and synthetic, uh, synthetic products coming up because kind of like we always say, hey, it's like one bad apple spoils a whole bunch, right? And so all of these emergence of these unregulated, unregulated products that are just kind of a lot of them being done in labs, are you worried about that stigma affecting your ability to properly advocate and use the science that you gather? You know, I, I think people understand that when we come out forward and we're making medical claims, we'll be able to back it up. It's just not going to be the word of mouth side. And for me, again, it's kind of goes back to people. It's like it's individual choices. Make sure you're educating yourself and you understand what you're taking, what these things are. Sometimes, you know, we just see it with everything. It's just it's things become faddish and you, they, they get an intrigue ping to them and people have to have it. Then it kind of goes by the wayside because ultimately the consumers will, will speak to us. And, you know, that's one thing I like about the free market is like if you're in a business and you're making something, the end state is that you are making something that someone feels improves their life or their life. So if someone's taking it, it's like, I'm not really feeling this, whatever. I think the free market will kind of speak to it and will go away. Um, and then, you know, in terms of, you know, research or validating, again, I'm going to have the, we're, we'll have the data. We're going to have the evidence. So if people are saying, no, I don't believe it. I think you're just making false claims. Well, here's, we, we, we actually did trials. We actually did back this stuff up. And it, this is literally what it's doing on the scientific side. Yeah, and that would just show that if, if, if that happens, if you know, you're know when you're before Congress and somewhat you show them the data and then they, for whatever reason, don't accept it, then you can really just say that's a purely political response. Exactly. And, exactly. and not based on anything. Yep, 100%. I think on the product side, I just find, um, I find it incredible how you've taken your passion and your heart that's in this space for veterans and as, as a group of veterans and you've taken that all the way through, not just with the way that you've structured your entities and what your mission is, but also down to the, the how you name your products, how you named your company. Um, I think it's an incredible example of, of succeeding through really um, defining your mission and then following it all the way through to the end. Oh, I, I appreciate that. And yeah, it was, it was like transitioning for me was really tough. And I, at times I felt like I was just a Marine without a mission. 
And this company has saved my life. I mean, it really gives me that sense of purpose again. Um, I just think I've just kind of had that sheepdog DNA in me where I just like to go and serve and help people. And this is really kind of fulfilling everything. I mean, I haven't taken a paycheck since 2016 when I left my previous job and that's fine. Um, you know, ramen noodles are good. Peanut butter and jelly is great. Uh, but you know, the big thing is I'm happy, uh, family's taken care of. So I just think I'm really blessed right now. It's incredible. Well done. Yeah. Really well done. No, oh, thank you. Well, well, we could talk to you for hours, but we know you've probably <laughs> got to run on. Seriously, this was awesome. Uh, you know, us being kind of in the political regulatory side of this, we deal with, you know, the big con conceptual thinking of the legalization of cannabis. And it's awesome to actually have a conversation with someone. It's just literally doing something about it. There's, there's no study out there that's good enough. I'll get my own study. We'll, we're going to make this happen. And so that's just, it's remarkable. We need, we need more people like you in the industry. Um, so thank you again. Thank you for your service to our country, obviously. And we really hope that we can get you on again sometime soon. Oh, I look forward to it. Please let's keep in touch and love to keep you guys updated on what we're accomplishing here. And, uh, you know, we're going to do some great things together. So thank you for the platform. Really awesome. Appreciate yeah. Well, that's it for Morgan and I today. Again, special, many thanks to our guests. Um, we will see you all next week. And just your friendly reminder that while Morgan and I are attorneys, nothing contained in this video blog is meant to be construed as legal advice. If you're wanting to put a product in a particular market, we recommend you consult a local attorney. And with that, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you, Brian. Thank you.